Hey guys, uh, Mr. Clifford here. Uh, never run a online class before, so this will be an interesting thing for everybody involved. Um, I am going to start today um, by talking about a, a court case, a really famous court case <clears throat> in American history, and it um, pertains to students' freedom in school. Um, right now, I know school seems like a far away place. Uh, and I know that it must be very frustrating for all of you guys to try to think about school right now. Um, but I'm going to try to do my best to continue teaching um, and to help you guys out the best that I can. Um, it is important that um, you guys uh, email me with questions and I can get right back to you. Um, but I also am hoping that I'll be able to explain everything to you in these videos uh, as you watch them. <clears throat> I think the first thing that you want to do is probably pause this video right now and I want you to get to a court case that's on Google Classroom called West Virginia versus Barnett. Uh, the questions will be available to you. Uh, we'll go over those first and then we'll read the article together. I am going to stop and talk about a lot of parts of the article um, so that you guys will have a better understanding of the importance of the case, uh, how these cases are decided, um, and particularly uh, how the Supreme Court works. So you guys go ahead and make sure you have everything you need. West Virginia versus Barnett, it's on Google Classroom. Uh, it's under the Four Freedoms folder. And I think that you'll find that if you review those questions first, and then uh, I'll review them with you, and then we'll be looking at the article and reading it together. I think uh, you reading as I'm reading and talking about it will be really helpful. So I'm gonna pause right now. You guys should do the same and make sure you have everything you need. So, I hope you have the questions in front of you. Um, the targets for the questions are I can organize uh, my ideas into a paragraph. I can write a topic sentence that introduces the topic and restates the question, so a TTQA. Uh, and I can plan, draft, and revise my work, which means that you're going to have other people help you with your work once it's done uh, to edit it. I would suggest that while you do that, um, you can read to someone online. Um, you can read and record it and then sound, listen to how it sounds. You can have someone, I think the best way to do it is have someone read it to you and hit, listen to how it sounds. Um, it is important that you get as much help as you can before you submit this work. Uh, and we're going to talk about work submission a little bit later. I think we're going to have a whole little video on that. Um, anyway, I just want to go over these questions first. So the first question is, why did the uh, Barnett children refuse to sal salute the flag? Now the Barnett's were a, a family, um, and they had two children in school, and they were uh, children who were uh, very religious, and they refused to salute the flag, and a lot of this uh, court case is around religion, and also around free speech, and symbolic speech, and um, what kind of responsibilities we have as Americans to show our patriotism. So the first question again is, why did the Barnett children refuse to salute the flag? The second question is, in this question, you're not going to be able to answer it from the article as far as you're not going to be able to take information from the article to support your answer on this one. This one is um, you coming up with uh, an answer based on all of the information, putting it together. So this question is, why might the issue of patri patriotic ceremonies like saluting the flag have been particularly sensitive at the time of this case? Now, this case took place... Um, let's see here, <clears throat> in 1943. So those of you who are um, familiar with that time period, you'll know that there was something really important going on in 1943 that challenged all Americans in, in multiple ways and challenged people throughout the world. Um, and so why might uh, the idea of refusing to salute the flag, why might that been particularly sensitive, meaning why would, would that offended society more in 1943 than in other time periods? So let me see if I can get back to the questions here. Okay, question number three. Much of Justice Jackson's majority opinion has become basic to our modern understanding of the First Amendment. Justice Jackson is a Supreme Court justice. His opinion was groundbreaking at the time. So why was it so important what he said in this quotation? 
Now, a lot of the Supreme Court justices speak in what I would call legalese, meaning they use language that you might not find common. Uh, I would suggest that um, you listen to me and then you also, it's okay to Google uh, certain words if you don't understand them, okay? And a, a lot of what you're going to learn over the coming days and weeks is how to be an independent learner. And that is a real personal choice and I, and I hope you all embrace that. Um, so here's the quote. And this, this quote is a big deal. One's right to life, liberty, and property, to free speech, a free press, freedom of worship and assembly, and other fundamental rights may not be submitted to vote. They depend on the outcome of no elections. What did he mean by this? And I'll read that one more time. One's right to life, meaning any, individual, any individual's right to life, liberty and property, a free speech, a free press, freedom of worship and assembly, and other fundamental rights may not be submitted to vote. They depend on the outcome of no elections. So a fundamental right is a right that we are guaranteed under the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights. So we have inalienable rights, they call them, um, almost like breathing if you're an American, if you, if you are uh, devoted to the Constitution. Um, that we have these rights and no one can take them away, even the majority of the population cannot vote away a small group or a minority's right to these, these fundamental rights. So even the majority cannot take away the rights of the minority um, for any reason. So these rights are something that are etched in our highest law and they cannot be negotiated or taken away, even by the highest ranking politicians and even by the majority in a vote, okay? It's a very uh, groundbreaking idea, even though I think it was already there, but the way uh, Justice Jackson put it all together for us. Uh, Justice Frankfurter, this is question four. Now, I, I, I'm gonna have to tell you that there's two sides to every argument in the Supreme Court. There is the side of the majority and the side of the minority. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, we always hear and document and write down the opinion of the winners in a Supreme Court case. So whoever is on the majority side of, that, of those nine Supreme Court justices. But we also keep all of the losing sides uh, ideas as well. Uh, all of those things are documented and kept so that we can go back and over history, take a look at these ideas and their importance, both the winning side and the losing side. Now, Justice Frankfurter uh, was on the losing side and they call that the dissenting opinion, um, meaning he is dissenting against the majority. He is um, speaking out even though his side lost. Uh, and in his opinion, this is what he talks about. So Justice uh, Frankfurter in his dissenting opinion said that the will of the majority should not be overturned by the Supreme Court, which um, I think that most uh, legal scholars don't look at it that way anymore. He believed that the court should defer or give in to the West Virginia legislature and the State Board of Education. Explain his interpretation of this issue. So Justice Jackson and Justice Frankfurter are the two opposing views here. Justice Jackson saying, no one can vote away fundamental rights. Justice Frankfurter saying the Supreme Court, which is based in Washington, D.C., should not interfere with state governments and the laws that the majority of the people want. Okay, so that's a big difference of opinion. Um, and question number five, the, the final question of this, um, is do you agree more with Justice Frankfurter or more with Justice Jackson? Now, uh, people's success and their grade uh, in these articles does not depend on anything other than how well you present your opinion. If you agree with the dissenting opinion or the majority opinion is irrelevant, it's more of how do you use the text to support your answer. Uh, we're looking for well-written responses, but opinion is yours. We can't study the First Amendment and free speech and tell you that your opinion is wrong. <laughs> we can only tell you how well you present your opinion no matter what side you choose. So those are the questions. I'm gonna give you guys a minute. I want you to go over and now I want you to take a look 
at the article and get ready for that. So I'm going to pause this for a second and then you guys can take a look at that. Hey guys, uh, back again. Um, I hope that you are able to find the article um, on West Virginia versus Barnett. You'll notice <clears throat> at the top of the article, um, it says West Virginia State Board of Education versus Barnett. So you'll notice that West Virginia State Board of Education um, is on one side and then versus Barnett. Um, and we're going to find out about why West Virginia was first and Barnett was second in a minute. <clears throat> You'll notice that there's a case number. It says 319 U.S. 624 and then 1943. So the case number is how they organize all of these cases. And the 1943 was the year that this case um, was uh, br brought to the Supreme Court. Um, often Supreme Court cases from the action to the decision can take up to five years, even longer. Um, sometimes it can come very quickly. There's a court case we'll be reading later called uh, uh, Texas versus Johnson, and we'll, we'll, we'll go over that. And, and that court case um, happened much faster, particularly when it was um, voted upon twice. Uh, so the, the, the timing of these cases can be very frustrating for everybody involved because sometimes they happen quickly and sometimes they happen um, over an extended period of time. So you'll also notice that there's a, a line that says vote and it was six to three, um, which many of the cases we'll read are going to be five to four. Um, this decision was uh, a clear majority. Um, and then you'll notice underneath that it says for the court and that is Justice Jackson. Now Justice Jackson um, is the one that who is in I think question number four, um, and he had a lot to say about this court case, and he wrote the for, the for the Court opinion, which means he was on the majority side, and he was picked by the majority side to write the, I guess, the dominant narrative, to write the, <laughs> the opinion of the majority. Um, and uh, Justice Jackson um, was uh, a, a very outspoken um, critic of the opposition as well, of the dissenting side. Um, below for the court, it says concurring. Now, to concur is to agree. So Justice Black, Justice Douglas, and Ju Justice Murphy were all in agreement with Justice Jackson. And if you count those three and Justice Jackson, that's four. That means that two people from the majority didn't write any opinion at all. Um, there's no requirement as far as I know. I'm not a um, Supreme Court or constitutional expert. But I, I, I don't think that there's any requirement for justice to write opinions in any case, but most of them do at some point. Um, on the dissenting side, uh, all three of the dissenting justices wrote uh, an opinion, and they wrote all three of them wrote dissenting opinions, meaning the voice of the side that lost. And that was Justice Frankfurter, Justice Roberts, and uh, Justice Reed. So that's every court case is going to have uh, the title, the year, the case number, the vote, um, who voted, what, what, the, what the vote total was. Um, there's going to be a for the court opinion, uh, a concurring opinion, and a dissenting opinion. Um, the, of the cases that we'll study, there's always going to be uh, for the court, concurring, and dissenting. Now I'm going to start reading this article. I, I hope that it's helpful to you guys. Um, I am going to stop a lot, so if any point you want to turn me off and s just put it on pause, you can, and then you can go back and revisit it. Um, if you see the answer to one of the questions, um, I would stop, um, and then I would go back, and I would find information to support that answer, okay, or take the information from the article. One thing I'm going to say about these questions is I want to short topic sentences, okay, and I want to TTQA, turn the question around. I also want you guys to be able to um, use the text to support your answer. If you're answering the question and not providing quotations from the text, direct quotations from the text, now that direct quotation could be very short or it could be an entire quotation. Um, you're going to want to use the text to support whatever answers you come up with. Another thing I want you to think about is sometimes we're going to have to analyze or read about a quote, meaning I'm going to want you to put the quote in your words. 
I'm going to want you to break the quote into parts. And I'm going to want you to be able to explain the quote. Um, the advantage to having um, the video is you'll be able to stop it. You'll be able to go back um, and you'll be able to listen to me explain each section of the video. Um, and most of you don't have a lot of other things going on. At least I don't think you do. Um, so I'm hoping that you'll take the time to really listen to these videos and use them to your advantage. Um, so I'm going to start reading. Uh, I hope you guys can follow along. Uh, and, and again, if you have any questions, you might want to jot them down to a piece of paper and then, um, you know, uh, ask me in via email a little bit later. Um, so I'm going to start reading. Let's see here. The government of West Virginia made a law that required students in public schools to salute the flag and pledge allegiance to it. So this was very common throughout the United States in the 1940s um, that it be a law that every student salute the flag. And today it is not a, uh, it is a state law for schools to salute the flag. It is not a law that students must stand up and salute the flag. This is a court case um, that helped pave the way for people who either don't want to salute the flag for religious reasons or political reasons or it's against their conscience. Maybe they're um, angry at the U.S. government for um, the Iraq war and the invasion of Iraq. Maybe they're upset about um, military action that the United States has taken or the treatment of immigrants in the United States. Um, those, those, uh, those events can lead some people to want to uh, show their frustration with the government by refusing to salute the flag or pledge to the United States flag. Um, that's a personal choice. I know that there's people on both sides of the issue who feel very strongly um, either that everyone should be required to salute the flag or that if someone it's against their conscience or their religion to salute the flag, they shouldn't be forced to. My personal opinion and is that I don't think that people should be forced to salute the flag, but I think people should salute the flag. Um, I think that if you're not going to salute the flag, it is for a reason that is something that you've discussed with your family and your parents. Um, and it is something if you're going into a classroom, especially for the first time, and someone is asking you to stand salute the flag, that before you uh, start that class, before you go to that first home room in high school, um, that you go tell that teacher ahead of time that you have a reason that you are refusing to salute the flag and that you're not doing it to disrespect the teacher or to disrupt the classroom, but you're doing it in order to um, make a point and, and, and um, live with your own conscience about something. Uh, it's a complicated issue and I would suggest that you go to your parents about it and talk to them about it uh, or an adult you trust, uh, but I do think that we have a responsibility to make sure that other people around us, particularly if you're going into a new environment like a high school, that those people have uh, a heads up that this is something that you don't feel comfortable doing. Uh, sorry about that, guys. I get little tangents. I start to talk about this stuff. Um, anyway, I'm going to continue reading the article. I hope that you can follow along, and I'll, I'll try to stop only uh, at the end of each paragraph. Okay, so we read the government of West Virginia made a law that required students in public schools to salute the flag and pledge allegiance to it. Refusal to comply with this act would be considered insubordination, punishable by expulsion from school. Readmission to school would be granted only on condition that the student comply with the flag salute law. Furthermore, expelled students would be considered unlawfully absent from school and their parents or guardians would be liable to prosecution. So, there's a law that says you have to salute the flag. If you refuse to salute the flag, you are expelled from school. The only way you can get back into school, according to this law, was if you said you would salute the flag again. Another twist to this is basically every for every day that you miss, your parents might be held accountable for you being truant from school. So if a student is refusing to salute the flag, they're expelled. They can't come back until they wanted or, or said they were going to promise to salute the flag. 
if the student stayed out of school, the parents would then be held accountable for their students' uh, unlawful absence, which shows you that this law uh, was a very heavy-handed way of forcing people and families to make children salute the flag. Uh, and again, there are people who I think still today would like to see this law uh, back, um, but this was the first court case where people really spoke out and challenged um, laws like this. Uh, and particularly the interest of, of this um, court case is that it's in the school environment, uh, as all the cases that we're going to read are about uh, how laws became laws in school. Um, so, I'll keep reading. Some children and their parents, who were Jehovah Witnesses, refused to obey the flag salute law on the grounds that it violated their religious beliefs. They viewed the flag of the United States as a graven image, and their religion forbade them to bow down to or worship a graven image. They argued that God's law was superior to laws of the state. In turn, the local school authorities, backed by the West Virginia Board of Education, moved to punish the children and parents who would not obey the law. Thus, several West Virginia Jehovah's Witness families, including the family of Walter Barnett, sued for an injunction to stop enforcement of the flag salute law. So, a lot in that paragraph, and I'll try my best to explain it. Um, Jehovah Witnesses is a basically a, a Christian-based religious group, um, and they are basically saying that in their um, beliefs, uh, in their uh, doctrine, in their uh, laws around worship, um, they could only worship God, and they could only salute God. Anything other than God, and many religions have a variation of this, anything other than God, they cannot pledge to uh, because it would be considered a graven image or an image other than God. And in their religion, they are not allowed to pledge or worship anything other than God. So by forcing the children to salute the flag, they were uh, the law was forcing them to break one of the most important aspects of their religion. Um, they argued, the Jehovah Witnesses, that God's law is superior to the laws of the state. Um, and I think this, again, is one of those things that freedom of worship in the First Amendment to the Bill of Rights is trying to emphasize that, um, that people's right to pursue religion is something that should not be inhibited, prohibited, uh, slowed down, or... Um, obstructed. So people's right to worship the way they want to write, or, or their right to worship the way they want to worship should not be um, uh, inhibited or stopped in any way. So uh, because of this, the State Board of Education in West Virginia, um, it says here that they, uh, they punished the children through uh, expulsion. Um, and then the families, uh, the Jehovah Witness families, um, and the, the family that I, I guess was chosen in order to, to fight this, to be the, the face of the movement, were the Barnett family. Now, the Barnett family sued for an injunction. Now, an injunction uh, is a way for the court to say this. It's a court timeout. It's like everybody stop. The kids can go back to school until the courts, uh, in this case, the Supreme Court, has time to pass a judgment on, uh, on this issue. So again, this is uh, the ways that the court um, uh, create a timeout so that they can really look at this law to decide if the law is constitutional or unconstitutional. Remember the Supreme Court's job one of their jobs is to decide whether or not a law meets constitutional muster or is constitutionally valid. Um, and the laws cannot go against 
um, the highest law, which is the Constitution of the United States. Um, and so the, the way to uh, figure out if the law is legal or not is for someone to challenge it. And in this case, the Jehovah Witnesses and the Barnett family challenged the state law to force students to salute the flag. And now we're going to find out what happens uh, after a moment, a, a brief uh, um, break. All right, we'll continue reading the article. Uh, and you'll notice halfway down the page, it says the issue. Did the West Virginia flag salute law violate the constitutional right to religious freedom of children professing the religion of Jehovah's Witness? Opinion of the court. So this is where we get to the winning side, the majority side of the court, and this is where we're going to um, start to see uh, some of the quotes that you guys are going to have to understand how to break down um, and paraphrase in your own words um, and bring the meaning of the quote uh, out by explaining maybe its parts. So here we go. Opinion of the court. The court ruled that West Virginia flag salute requirement was unconstitutional, meaning that the law itself went against the Constitution, so therefore could not be a law. Justice Robert H. Jackson said that public officials could act to promote national unity through patriotic ceremonies. That means you can encourage for people to salute the flag. Encourage. However, they could not use compulsion or force people of any kind or the kind employed in this case to enforce compliance. So they can't, they can encourage but not force. <clears throat> in particular, the First Amendment to the Constitution applied to the state government through the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment, don't worry about that too much right now, prohibited public officials from forcing students to salute the flag against their religious beliefs. Justice Jackson concluded with one of the most quoted statements in the annals of the Supreme Court. So, just so you guys know, um, this quote is difficult, okay? And it is something um, that has uh, been the foundation of future cases around, um, around uh, religious freedom and around school law. So I'll start reading. The very purpose of the Bill of Rights was to withdraw certain subjects from the vicissitudes of political controversy, to place them beyond the reach of majorities and officials, and to establish them as legal principles to be applied by the courts. One's right to life, liberty, and property, to free speech, a free press, freedom of worship and assembly, and other fundamental rights may not be submitted to vote. They depend on the outcome of no elections. If there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official high or petty can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion, or force citizens to confess by word or act their faith therein. If there are any circumstances which permit an exception, they do not now occur to us. Now, I'm going to try to break that down into a language that more people can understand. Um, and I'll do my best. I, again, uh, I'm not a constitutional expert, um, but I've read this article a few times, and I think I have a handle on it. So what they're saying here is the reason that we have the Bill of Rights. One reason is to protect us from bad government, uh, and the other reason we have the Bill of Rights and the Constitution is to protect us from bad government. Now, the rights that are outlined in the Bill of Rights are to be pulled out of everyday life and held above all things. So we are supposed to, the Bill of Rights is to, supposed to withdraw certain subjects, to take things like our fundamental freedoms from the vicissitudes of political controversy to take them out of the fray, from the infighting, from the politics, from um, the differences of opinion, uh, and rise them up as things that all Americans have, regardless of who they are 
uh, regardless of what their religion, the color of their skin, all the, the, these rights rise above all things. Uh, and as we all know, we haven't gotten there yet, <laughs> but this, this case was another uh, step forward in the right direction, in my opinion. To place them beyond the reach of majority. So to take the freedoms, the fundamental freedoms, and put them above the will of the people, which sounds uh, different, I guess. I don't know. It doesn't sound scary to me, but it definitely, to, when we live in a democracy, to find out that there are things um, that we cannot take away even with a majority vote. To take them beyond the reach of, a fit of majorities and officials, meaning politicians, and to establish them as legal principles to be applied by the courts. So these ideas should really only be wrestled with, um, in Justice Jackson's opinion, by taking our highest law, the Constitution, and having the Supreme Court decide by putting new laws through the filter of the Constitution to force a law to see if it is meeting the freedoms that are outlined in the Constitution. If it doesn't meet these freedoms, then it should not be a law at all. So he's saying one's, life to, uh, one's right to life, liberty, and property, to free speech, free press, freedom of worship and assembly, and other fundamental rights may not be submitted to vote. They depend on the outcome of no elections. So he's saying that this right that these people have to practice their religion the way they want to cannot be voted on by a school board or um, appointed officials in the State Department of Education, that these freedoms are beyond the will of the majority and beyond um, the opinion of, of uh, the state government. And then he goes on to, you know, he's showing off a little bit. I'm just going to put that out there. If there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, so if, of all the things that we know about the Constitution, of all the rights that are uh, before us as Americans, it is that no official, high or petty, meaning, uh, I don't mean to say that the mayoral campaign or the mayor, mayor is low, but uh, ver whether it's a mayor or a school committee member or uh, any elected official, all the way up to the President of the United States, um, is that no official, high or petty, can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion. So no one can say, this is the way you have to believe. This is what you have to think about. This is what you have to worship. This is what you have to express an opinion because the whole idea of religion, freedom of religion, is that it's your choice to worship the way you want to, but it also is a speech issue, that um, we can't tell people what to think, believe, or express. Um, if there are any circumstances which permit an exception, they do not now occur to us. In other words, he's saying this should be the final <laughs> uh, decision on this issue. Um, so, complicated, but how are you going to explain that? Uh, I know we're sort of pushing you to do work that's maybe more high school than middle school, um, but I have faith that you guys can do it. And you probably have a little more time than normal to work on it right now. So I suggest you do. Uh, the last part of this article is the dissent and the significance. Dissent is to disagree. So this is the opinion of the disagreeing side. And this is Justice Felix Frankfurter. Uh, is one of those people. So I'll continue reading. Justice Felix Frankfurter concluded that the state school board had the constitutional authority to require public schools, require public school students to salute the flag. He wrote that by not complying with the laws, minorities can disrupt government and civil society, and therefore the court should support the duly enacted legislation at issue in this case, which clearly reflected the will of the majority in West Virginia. If citizens of West Virginia dislike laws enacted by their representatives in the state legislature, then they could try to influence the legislature to change the laws. According to Justice Frankfurter, the Supreme Court had overstepped its authority in placing its judgment above that of the elected legislature and school boards in West Virginia. And this is Justice Frankfurter's quote. You'll notice his quotation marks around it. The courts ought to stand aloof from this type of controversy, he concluded. Frankfurter especially objected to Jackson's argument that questions associated with a Bill of Rights should be beyond the reach of local officials and legislature. Frankfurter believed judges had a duty to respect and give in to the discretion of legislatures and the laws they passed. Which is interesting coming from a Supreme Court justice because they're supposed to be the ones that are um, the final word 
in whether a law is legal or whether a law meets constitutional muster. Um, so for him to say this, um, I guess from a, from a modern viewpoint or a modern lens, um, doesn't necessarily make sense to me. What does, um, I think what, what, what Justice Frankfurter is trying to get to is this idea that if the majority wants something, if the majority of the people in a state want something, if 90% of the people want there to be a flag salute law, why should 10% of the population be, over, be, be able to overrule the will of the majority? And why should a Supreme Court that isn't in West Virginia, um, that is in Washington, D.C., have the right to, um, you know, uh, t dictate what is legal or illegal in a state where they do not live, uh, in a state where they are not elected, and overrule the will of the majority and overrule the will of the majority's elected officials. Um, when if the majority wants uh, a law um, to be in place, the majority should have the right to make that decision and that everyone in that state should follow that law. Uh, I th and again, that is Justice Frankfurter's opinion. That might be many of your opinions. Why should a, a group of six Supreme Court justices in another place in the federal government have the right to overrule the majority of the people and elected officials that live in a state? And again, I think that what you're going to find is these, this idea of states' rights, which is one of your vocabulary words, by the way, um, and the idea of a more um, centralized federal government. That's a, a big uh, rub in our history about where power comes from and um, who makes the final decisions. Well, um, I, I think when you have a constitution and you live in a republic, where uh, you have elected officials and you have a democracy, um, th that is what we want. We want the democracy to decide. But at the same time, we have a constitution, which is uh, our, our highest law, which says that there are certain things that the majority cannot take away. And again, uh, the majority um, can sometimes make mistakes. And the government can make mistakes. So the idea of a constitution is to say that those mistakes or those decisions, uh, or maybe those that not mistakes, maybe they're still the majority opinion, they cannot um, inhibit or take away the rights of any group, um, regardless of their religion, race, um, and they use the term here, minority meaning a, a smaller group of population, that, that the majority cannot take away those rights. So again, the Constitution, one of the things I want you to remember is the Constitution is a way to protect people from bad government and to protect uh, small groups of people or minorities from the uh, dominant will of the majority. Um, so the final part of this is the significance of this article. The Barnett decision overturned the court's ruling only three years earlier in Minersville School District versus Gobitis, Gobitis? which upheld a Pennsylvania law requiring students in public schools to pledge allegiance to the American flag. The flag salute cases show how the Supreme Court can change its mind about the meaning of the Constitution. Applications of the doctrine of stare decisis, which is a really important legal term um, that I hope that all of you will um, remember. Uh, it's, it's very important. You'll read about it uh, in, in your future world as well. Um, which means the use of precedent or previously decided cases decide new cases, meaning building opinion upon existing opinions in the Supreme Court, uh, creates stability in the law. So if we're building upon past decisions, then it can create stability. But in this case, they actually went and did a 180 degree turn against previous decisions and decided that the Supreme Court uh, wanted there to be um, expansion of speech, expansion of religious rights in school, and to be and not force people to salute the flag if it was against their conscience or if it was against their religion. Uh, how, however, allowing for exceptions to stare decisis and overruling precedents are ways the court adapts the Constitution to changing conditions. 
the Barnett case set a new precedent or a new way of doing things uh, in our legal system, and, and the legal system has followed it to this day. Of course, this article was written uh, several years ago, but it still stands uh, that you cannot force someone to salute the flag. Federal courts applying the Barnett precedent have turned back several attempts by officials to establish new flag salute requirements. So, in other words, since this case, uh, the Supreme Court has uh, practiced stare decisis, meaning that they have used the basis of this case, the Barnett case, in order to make decisions for new challenges to force students to salute the flag. But they have held their ground in the Barnett case and the decisions around it still stand today. Um, thank you for listening. That's the uh, West Virginia versus Barnett uh, article and questions for you guys. I, uh, I know this is a lot to tackle, um, but at least you can uh, turn me off and listen to what I have to say again if you need to. Um, so I hope that this is helpful and I will see you guys and talk to you guys soon.